Turn that on. Okay. Excellent. Um, my bio didn't make it into the uh, the notes, would be in the proceedings. Uh, just a quick thumbnail. Uh, today, I classify myself as an entrepreneur, but I always I, w I haven't been one. Uh, I spent 22 years in the military as an armored officer, then as uh, a REMI officer. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of designing and architecting how the Army senses on the battlefield, uh, which was uh, one of the last things I did before I left, left the service. Uh, and I went on then to found ING Engineering in 2001. And in 2002, I founded a national association concerning robots that fly, swim, and crawl. And what I'm going to talk about today is the great success that we had from 2008 forward bringing these technologies to bear. Um, UAVs have been around for a long, long time. My job, when I, uh, when I finished my graduate studies in, uh, at the Naval, uh, U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in, in uh, signal processing and, and, and other electro squiggly amp type things, was to come back and take over the Army's UAV project. This was L-1225. It had been the dream of the Army for over 25 years. So I said our project model, 25 years of failure, the tradition continues. It took me uh, another decade before we actually got to where I wanted us to be, uh, and I had to do it as a private citizen, but that's okay. Uh, it formed the basis of, of what we went on to do. Uh, the, the end result was over 3,000 missions, 30,000 hours, direct support to the Canadian soldier in the field in Afghanistan. And that was my objective. So I, I've read uh, two, I think two business books now. Well, actually, they were, they're both audio books. But, but they were interviewing entrepreneurs and said, what, you know, we have to find your passion. What, it, what is it that drives you? For me, in 2006, it was the fact that friends of mine uh, who I'd served with in the Army, and true friends of mine, were either dying or in harm's way. And I thought, maybe I had a better plan. So that was, you know, everyone's got to find their passion. That was mine. Today we do a bunch more, and we'll talk about that. Now, I am the first guy after lunch, so I have put together a little movie just to keep you entertained. Uh, and this will run through the, as I talk. So you can either talk, listen to me or you can watch the movie. But no one really, uh, as I go around the world and talk about unmanned systems, no one really knows what I'm talking about. So uh, pictures will, will, will help illustrate that point. Um, but first, th to address where we are, this is, a, this is a panel on warbots. I absolutely hate the term warbots. Similarly, I hate the term drone. Because the press cannot say drone, they say spy drone, and they say killer drone. That is not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to extend the reconnaissance ability of whoever's doing things, the, uh, the collection of information beyond the fixed assets. And uh, that's what we went on to do very effectively in Afghanistan, so that when we flew in Afghanistan, Every morning at 7.30, we'd launch an aircraft, and every 45 minutes after that, we would put three aircraft up over the customers of the day. And at night, and then we would be the last ones to come back as the light faded, and then we would throw up this new technology with a, you know, cool thermal sensing with heat, which has turned out to be a, really game, a, a, a real game changer. These are the things that, that really are what, what's about today. Uh, so I prefer, really, the term robotic aircraft as opposed to, and no one uses robotic aircraft yet, but I've decided since I'm a, I'm a leading guy in the field, I'm going to call them robotic aircraft. We're about sort of the rumba technology level today, and where we're going is the Google car uh, uh, level of technology is where we're really going with the, these technologies. But it's fasc fascinating stuff. So the Scan Eagle required a number of changes, both sociological, uh, tribal, as well as technological. So to deliver this capability, what we had to do was show up with a, a little aircraft that cost about the same as a GPS-guided 155 munition. And, you know, to get there, I had to convince people that if we show up with this little thing, it'll actually work. And, uh, and the, I put the credit to uh, General Hilliard, and in particular, uh, General Natinchuk. 
because my experience, if without a visionary to allow these things to happen, it doesn't happen. Transformation does not happen without a visionary. And uh, General Walt Matinchuk was, was key for that because this was disruptive change. We went in there with civilians. So now, my civilians uh, were sergeant majors, warrant officers, sergeants, majors, captains, retired out of the, uh, uh, out of the Canadian Forces from critical traits, uh, critical classifications, and, um, and some very, very bright engineers. So we went on to uh, very ra rapidly replace a 56-person organization that was flying a large uh, aircraft designed for Europe, um, with three guys, three civilians, and four military, which then grew as we, uh, as we delivered over 40 hours every day to a troop of 18 and, and, uh, and seven civilians. So that was uh, truly a great capability, and it was exceptionally complementary to the other things that were going on. And that was key for our ability to succeed. So we worked well with, with the Heron, uh, it was complementary to the Heron that the Air Force uh, started to operate. We were complementary with the, the real uh, Reapers and uh, killing uh, warbots, which are the Reapers and Predators. We worked well with them because we could do pattern of life and decide what was important, what wasn't. I guess for me, the big thing was that we were the uh, unseen angel for the Canadian troops. So when a convoy went out, there wasn't a soldier who was allocated this asset who didn't have it. And I thought that that was a great uh, thing for me. Um, we, had, uh, we went on to uh, support the Navy. So we, Afghanistan, we, we worked all the way through to last summer, which I, I term my, uh, my uh, summer of, uh, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Don't touch your technology once you've started it. Um, I was just going to slow that down because I'm not keeping up to my own speech here. <clears throat> I was going to talk a little bit about the next exciting thing we did within the NATO context was to be a complement to what our frigates do when they're deployed overseas. So a year ago, for the first time, the Charlottetown uh, got itself an unmanned aircraft. And this uh, has proved to be a, a tremendous asset, particularly uh, as the Navy has learned how to employ it. So I had the opportunity to be in Dubai a, a couple of weekends ago, visiting uh, HMCS Regina, and in the space of less than a year, this UAV capability has become a critical enabler for their mission and sees them getting all the really cool jobs in Combined Task Force 150. So they're able to, uh, at night, uh, every night, they launch the aircraft uh, with a great thermal capability that the, that the CEO told me, I can watch rats running around on the back of these ships that we're, we've uh, we found on our radar, now we need to go see. And why it's important is because the rules of engagement for these guys insist that they must, it's only vessels without flying a flag of registry that they're allowed to board. So by covertly uh, visiting the sh these, all these vessels, looking at them, then they're able to see whether it has a flag of registry, they chip that image off, they send it up to the headquarters, the headquarters says yes, they move the ship up during the night, and it, in the morning, uh, then they're able to go out and start to do the uh, boarding exercises. And on the 5th of May, great story about how we were able to, as a combined team, do cool stuff. Um, at night, they, they pick up a vessel of interest, uh, two vessels of interest. Um, at day, the Sea King launches, the Rib launches, and they're able to go out and capture uh, many millions of dollars, a huge uh, stash of, of drugs, which is a counter-narcotic mission. So that's a very, very good story. And again, none of this would be possible even five years ago. 
So it's a rapidly moving technology and how it impacts the way we operate in the world. <clears throat> so if we expand that into a more global view, um, you know, the, the market is still dominated by, by, by US and, and other players. But in Canada, we're developing our own capabilities here, which are, which are, are very cool. Critical enablers for both land and maritime operations. And uh, the commander of the, the Navy has already told me, we don't plan to, sh to, to deploy another ship without a UAV capability. And if you start to think about northern, the northern part of our country now, Opnanuk very successfully employed up there, you start to see where, where a community-based UAS or UAV or robotic aircraft might have a role to play. Because now, think about search and rescue. Dark and stormy night. It's always a dark and stormy night. And we put people in harm's way and we lose people every year because they go out to try and protect and save others. If you had a robot or a series of different robots that could go out and look and then get, and know and find people, maybe even give them emergency aid and then put your people on to go and rescue them. Those are, are big things that we can do. Husbandry of our resources. Amazing amount of uh, development going on in our north. How do, we, how do we ensure that these big, often foreign mining companies are doing what we want? Our Northwest Passage, which other part, other, our neighbors don't even call that. How do we know what they're doing? Well, one of the ways is to actually give them assistance with tactical ice survey, and then we can actually see what they're doing. And then the fact that you'd be able to go up north and actually create jobs for, for Canadian youth in remote uh, regions, I think is the coolest thing of all. So there's some great potentials as we bring these technologies from where we've been very successful in hot and high and uh, dangerous places like Afghanistan and the Gulf of Aden, if we, we bring these technologies back to roost in Canada and start to address some of our other uh, issues which we have which are resource constrained. So I see very much, I, I love holding up iPhones just as, as one of the former speaker did. You know, this speaks to me of a number of things, not the least of which technology resolution uh, and sensors just keep getting smaller, better, right? But think of it in the context of military communications, how we used to be, communications used to be the domain of the military. I would put to you that the military could not create an iPhone. It, the processes wouldn't exist. Similarly, I'm seeing uh, this shift now with thousands of these robotic aircraft coming under the market. I'm seeing it being driven now by the commercial market as opposed to the military market. So something just to keep in mind that we're going to see more and more and better and better and it won't all be driven by an ISR requirement. We have some challenges uh, to deal with uh, as, we, as we work through those issues. Uh, safe use of the airspace, something that we, we've got well, we're leading in in Canada. Um, but there's some other advantages to uh, pushing these technologies into the places like the oil and gas and mining industries, in addition to being uh, effective and safe and green. Uh, as our Canadian interests go, our mining companies go offshore and oil companies are working offshore, the ability for them to be better able to deal with their own uh, security, uh, as well as the, the way they actually go and collect data is, I think, an important national thing for us to do because it keeps them from getting into trouble sometimes. And we've seen examples of where that's a problem. So the ability to monitor pipelines, transmission lines, uh, communications infrastructure are all very important things. <clears throat> so there are a, a variety of uh, emerging uh, and exceptional, and from my perspective as a technologist, exceptionally cool things that we can do with these robots. It's becoming very practical, it's cost effective, and as we've seen in all of our operations, both in Afghanistan and uh, with the Navy, uh, very complementary to the current capabilities. So there's room for all, and I think uh, over time we'll see more and more use as just budgets drive these things into uh, seeing robots out and doing their job. Now, warbots, spy planes, uh, or spy, um, 
uh, spy drones and killer drones. Uh, again, what we do in Canada, I think, is safe and effective. And I had to answer this question uh, when interviewed by CBC North in Whitehorse last year. They said, you know, we're pretty... Um, well, first off, the interview started with uh, uh, the intro she, she showed me she was going to read, which was all about spy drones and killer drones. Uh, I said, could we, not, could we not do that? I really would like to talk about robotic aircraft. She said, you know, we're pretty private folks up here in the north. And what, you know, what, with your spy planes, what would you be doing? I said, if I'm out counting caribou, that's the only time I want to know you're there because I want to take you out of the count. We have great laws in Canada. I think it's Section 8. There's many lawyers in the room, and I'm not one. But we have great laws that prevent anyone from looking at you unless there's a reason to look at you. And so I think we're tackling a number of the issues the right way. Our American friends have a lot more difficult role to hold than we do. We have vast, a vast country. Most of us live snuggled up against the U.S. border. So there's not a lot of air traffic. There's a lot of things that we don't know about our country because we can't afford to go visit it. And now we've got a way to do it. Um, so that would be the sort of final bit of, of, of my presentation because I wanted to keep it pretty much the time to give you lots of time to talk or ask questions. Uh, what you see this last little bit just happens to be uh, a robotic aircraft that uh, we've built uh, with similar capabilities to what we had in Afghanistan but designed specifically so we can export it and use it and use it in the Arctic in particular. So there's a, there's a number of things ab just about product design which haven't been addressed in the industry writ large, which we're addressing uh, in Canada. So today, ING Engineering, just under 50 people, offices uh, here in Ottawa, Sherbrooke, uh, and uh, serving our customer out of, out of our Fredericton office with the Army. Uh, at any given time, I'll have guys uh, working with the Army training the next uh, the high readiness brigade, having guys uh, on the ship, working with uh, commercial customers uh, around the world. So it's kind of cool. It's a great place to be. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for your um, presentation on uh, the role of uh, robotic aircraft in Canada, uh, your industry's involvement in uh, developing this bit of technology, and your insights in what you've done uh, in the recent past.